Well, hello, Pastor Chris Myros here at Glory Baptist Church, and it is now officially, I guess, December 1st. I've been out snow blowing for the last three hours, and uh, it looks like it's going to continue on snowing all the way through into noon tomorrow. And so we have called off church and called off our Sunday school, all activities on December 1st on 2019, but we don't want to go without uh, the Word of God, and while we may not gather in the church itself, we can still worship and praise and listen to a sermon, and I will provide some links in Facebook at least that people can view some worship songs and sing along at home. And you can always go to YouTube and find if you've got a favorite Christmas hymn you would like to sing or whatnot, um, you could certainly do that. And uh, otherwise, take your pick at whatever it was, whatever it is that you might like. So this is going to be a little bit different. I've never done anything like this before, so you'll have to bear with me. And uh, I normally like to talk with my hands, and the format just doesn't allow for that. So you won't see a whole lot of these, I suspect, and you'll have to live with my facial inf inflections and whatever you get there. Uh, over here on this side is where my computer screen is, and that has all my notes for the sermon. And so if you see me kind of looking that way, that is why. So to kick things off here, we're going to be in uh, 2 Kings 25. This is the first week of Advent in 2019, and the sermon title is Exile and Hope in a King. And we're kicking off Christmas season, as I said here. Um, it is 2 Kings 25. If you'd like to grab a Bible and follow along, you can open up uh, version on your computer screen, on your phone, uh, grab a paper Bible, um, whatever it is that you like, um, grab that and we'll do that. We're going to be doing Advent or Christmas, you know, sermons all the way through Christmas. And then in January, we're going to have 21 days of prayer and then we'll go back to the Gospel of John. And I'm honestly really excited about this uh, Advent sermon series. I've I have thought long and hard on it, worked hard at it, uh, did a lot of pre-work way back in September, actually, for it um, so that I can be ahead and let things kind of percolate in my head, and that's the way I work. My workflow is I try to be months ahead in my planning so that when it comes time to preach, I've got plenty of time to think it through and think it over, and um, that works well for me at least. And, and as I said, I'm excited for this Advent season, this ser Advent sermon series, and the idea is that uh, Advent should help us orientate our lives to the true story of the Word of God. And of course, as and as the case in so many churches, but I know for sure in our church, um, so many of the people come from different backgrounds, different traditions. Uh, I grew up in a Lutheran church. I used to pastor a congregational church. My theological home or sweet spot is the Converge Baptist General Conference is kind of where I really reside well theologically and um, find a lot of like-minded people and um, can affirm that statement of faith quite well and, and I appreciate it. And because of this diversity, because we have people who have Catholic backgrounds, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, no church, Baptist, um, all kinds of people at Glory Baptist Church. We're not all just Baptists. And, and because of that, different backgrounds, those different traditions, <clears throat> some people are perhaps more uh, familiar than others with participating in the church calendar, um, the more liturgical style of, of worship that some churches employ. Um, and so with, with that range of some people being more or less um, experienced with that, I thought it would be good to maybe spend a few minutes um, talking through, uh, walking through why we would specifically do a sermon series on Advent, because we're not a traditionally liturgical church, um, but that certainly doesn't mean we can't utilize Advent and, and leverage those items and, and whatnot. And, and the idea behind Advent is that Advent serves as a, a corporate time for us to orientate our hearts and our minds to that what we believe is in the Bible, what the Bible says is true and what it says is good and what it says is beautiful. And as we think about entertaining um, the idea of the Christ incarnate, and as we come into this season of Advent, uh, we will spend the next few weeks looking at Advent itself through a couple of different lenses, maybe a, a different lens each week, so to speak. And we want to look at some different people 
uh, different groups of people in the Bible and the story of the coming of the Messiah this week, um, the Messiah who is to come, and the Messiah who has come to end our exile is the idea. And, and my hope is that for you, not just this week, but over the course of the next several weeks, if you're following along and, and part of uh, our worship at Glory Baptist, is that our hope is that you would grow in your knowledge of, of the story, uh, of the story of Christ coming to earth, and that you would grow in your understanding of your place within that story and your ability to participate in that story. Because Advent is, is actually all about knowing the, the story of the Bible. And as we dig in here today, you, you need to remember that as we read the Bible, particularly looking into the Old Testament, um, as we dig into that, we need to remember that exile is a is a very big and reoccurring theme in the Old Testament. As God's people sinned, God used exile as a tool to get them uh, to repent and turn back to him. Uh, I wish I could say people were smart enough to learn this lesson after just one go around, but that's not the case, unfortunately. Adam and Eve sinned. They were exiled from the Garden of Eden. Later, God covenants with Abraham to give him and his family land, a place to live and a place to flourish. And if you know your Old Testament, you know that Abraham's family had pretty much every imaginable, imaginable form of dysfunction ever. Um, and, and the long term, these people who were to be God's people end up living in exile under an oppressive ruler named Pharaoh in Egypt. Now again, God frees them but then they end up in this uh, season of exile once again, almost immediately after that, as they find themselves wandering in the desert for 40 years. Now, eventually, they make their way to the promised land, but exile keeps on coming due to their sinfulness. And, and years later, another of the exiles is the uh, Babylonian captivity, where, where the Israelites are, are literally taken prisoner. They're, they're carted off to other lands. They're made into slaves because they had turned their, their backs on God. So I hope you're starting to see a pattern here, right? And as we think about Advent, and we think specifically about the prophets, the question is, what is the message of the prophets to God's people who are in exile? As God's people live in exile, we wonder to ourselves, is God faithful? Is God's story true? Will he come for us? Will he end our exile? And the prophets have a very specific message for us, and that's what we're going to learn about here today in 2 Kings 25. I'm going to read some of that for you and would invite you, if you're in your Bible, to follow along with that. And there it reads, And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all of his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works around it. So the city was besieged till the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month of the famine, it was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls, by the king's gardens, the, and the Chaldean, or the Chaldeans, who are the Babylonians, um, were around the city. And they went into the direction of the Arabah, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king. So here David's son and, and David's men are being overtaken on the plains of Jericho. And then it reads, All of his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And they passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah, who was the king, before his own eyes. And then they put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him in chains, and took him to Babylon. Now at this point, it almost seems as if there's no hope for David's sons. But let's continue reading. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, 
Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard and a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And the rest of the people who were left in the city <coughs> and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, together with the rest of the multitude, uh, Nebuzaradan, Nebber, um, hard word for me to say right now, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and, plow and plowmen. And then jump down with me to verse 27. There it reads, And in the thirty-seventh year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, on the twenty-seventh day of the month, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him, and he gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. Now these kings are the, the lower-level rulers, magistrates, uh, not the actual top-level king, but under kings, so to speak. Um, and he's given a, a high seat, and it says, And every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king, according to his daily needs, as long as he lived. Now this is an, an incredible story. God's people living in God's land, disobedient, and, and they end up having their their city burned down, they're carried off into exile, but the king is still alive. And these are my points. Uh, the, the prophets remind us in this story of that our sinfulness, it, it brings exile, and that our exile, it brings despair. And our only hope in exile is the life of the king. So if you happen to download the sermon notes, the, the first note on the sermon notes is simply this. Our sinfulness brings exile. Look back at verse number six with me. Remember, our hope is in the king. It says that they, they captured the king and they brought up the king of, uh, and they brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And there they passed a sentence on him. They, they slaughtered his sons so that he wouldn't have any heirs. And then they took Zedekiah, the king, and they plucked his eyes out and bound him in chains and then took him on to Babylon. Now you hear this and you're like, wait a minute. How can our hope be in the king if this king is, is a prisoner in exile? How is he ever going to reign and rule over us? If we are in exile and, and the king is in exile and his sons have been killed... How will we have hope? And Israel's prophets over and over and over again warned God's people that, that their sinfulness or, or our sinfulness, our rebellion, our own hard-heartedness would lead to our exile and to our judgment. And those prophets gave us this message that, that our disobedience once again would lead us to be sent out of the presence of God and that if we are putting ourselves into the story that we will lose the thing that is most valuable to us. Not things, not people, not money, not comfort, but the very presence of God himself. Jeremiah says, he says, my hope is gone and grief has fallen upon me. My heart is actually sick within me. Behold the cry of the daughter of my people. The whole land is crying. Is the Lord no longer in Zion? Has he forgotten us? Is her king not with her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images and with their idols? Why have they worshipped anything else? Prophet Amos says it similarly. He says this. He says, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the laws of the Lord. They have not kept his statutes, but their lives had le have led them astray. So I will send fire upon Judah. I will devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. And as you think about Advent, the message of the prophets is this. We are in exile because we have sinned against God. 
exile is God's judgment upon our sin. And I keep using this word exile, right? It might be helpful to have a definition of what this is, of what exile is, and what the Bible calls exile. Here's a good definition of exile. Exile is the experience of pain, suffering, that results from the knowledge that there is a home where one belongs, yet for the present we can't go back there. This deep this sense of deep loss is compounded by a, by a sense of guilt or, or remorse stemming from the knowledge that the cause of the exile we experience is our sin. And this is something I don't have to tease out for a long time because every one of us has felt this. Sin and exile is a subject all of us know far too much about. All of us know far too well, even if we can't put words to it. We've all experienced. We don't have to be carted off to Babylon to have had an experience with this. And it's that, that deep longing, that groaning within us. We know that there is a home that we were made for, and this isn't it. Because if this is home, why then is there so much pain and so much shame and so much sin and so much darkness and so much death, right? Certainly, God's world is better than this. This can't be the, the, the presence of God. This must be exile. And not only does Israel find themselves in exile in 2 Kings 25, but the Bible describes that experience. It, it, it describes their experience, but it's also our experience, the, the church's experience, you and, and me as a people living in exile. And here's one thing I need you to be absolutely convinced of, and if we can't agree on this one thing, I'm not sure how much you would ever get out of whatever else I might say after this point. But the one thing that we need to agree upon is that one of the greatest dangers to your Christian life is believing that you are living in the kingdom when you are actually living in exile. You, me, the church, we have more in common with Daniel, who was in Babylon, than we do with King David, who was in Jerusalem. You have more in common with Israel's exiles, living under a foreign government, under foreign rule, living under foreign oppression, than you have in common with living under David's rule in Jerusalem. And the Bible is trying to tell us that all of our pain, all of our suffering, and all of our shame are actually symptoms of, of a far greater problem. They're symptoms of the lack of the presence of God. Exile. Exile is this disease we are all suffering from, and its symptoms are shame and guilt and death. But the disease itself is exile. The, the, the lack of presence of God. And the thing that is just heartbreaking and gut-wrenching about this is that it's our sin that has brought us here. So the prophets are reminding us, and they're reminding Israel, that it's our sinfulness that brings us to exile. And that brings us to my second point. If you're following along in the sermon notes, you'll see it's number two. And it's simply this. Our exile leads to despair. Look again at verse 9. It says, He burned down the house of the Lord. This was the, 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 the very place where God dwelled among his people, right? The place where heaven and earth meet. 
the place where grandparents were taking their grandkids and parents were taking their kids and every Israelite would have grown up wanting to experience the, the, the manifest presence of God, the God who had led us out of slavery, the God who had promised this land to our forefathers, the God who dwells with us in this temple, right? <clears throat> and, and this, this house is now collapsing in upon itself. Could you, could you imagine being carried into exile, uh, being bound in chains, and perhaps leaving everything you've ever worked for for all of your life, leaving that behind, and then as you go walking past the temple in Jerusalem, this place where God's presence dwells, and you see it collapsing, and you know at that point... I'm back in exile. How long is this going to last? Will God ever come back? Will our unfaithfulness last forever? <clears throat> you see, the, the house of the Lord was more than just a place of worship. It was more than just where Israel experienced the presence of God. It was the dwelling presence of God with his people. And its destruction represented exile. And his people had no idea how long that was going to last. Exile is painful. It's painful for us, and it was painful for them. Not because we lose things, but because we lose the very presence of God. Whether you are actually aware of your exile right now or not, if you're hearing my voice, you are in exile. Whether this exile is right in front of you and you're right in your face in every way, shape, or form, or whether it's through death or sickness or disease or sin or shame or guilt or, or whatever it is, no matter how close you can see it, it is absolutely there. It's there for each and every one of us, it's there for all of us. We are in exile. And in exile, one of the easiest things to do is start to believe in then false stories and, and start to begin to put hope into other things other than God, other than the gospel. We put our hope in the wrong things. We begin to believe these false stories in order to, in a way, help us deal and cope with the pain. We don't know what to do with all of the chaos of the world. And we'll find any strategy that we can possibly to latch on to that, that we hope might take the pain away, right? But don't miss this. Our only true hope in exile is in the life of the king. In exile, the only hope that you have, the only hope you have for that exile to end is if the king is alive. If the king is dead, all hope is lost. But if the king is alive, it's still possible that our exile will one day come to an end. And that brings us to the third point of our sermon. And if you're following along in the notes, you'll see it there. And it is this. Our only hope in exile is if the king is alive. Look back at verse 27. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, so we've had 37 years of despair, says, Evil Merodach, the king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign. Now, this blows my mind, honestly. This guy, this king, he frees... King Judah, the king of Judah, he frees him from prison, right? And not only does he do that, but he kind of, he, he speaks kindly to him. And then, not only does he do that, he says, let me give you a seat higher than the other kings under me. So, I've got all these guys, they're probably my pals, some of them might be my relatives, they're all important rulers, but I'm going to put you above them. I'm going to give you a seat above the kings of Babylon. So Jehoiakim takes off his prison garments and 
every day of his life, he sits with this king of Babylon and he enjoys, I'm sure, a remarkable meal every day. It's probably the best food in the world every day. And not only is he given that, he's given an allowance, right? Like a regular allowance. Hey, hey here's some money to, for your daily needs. I don't know what his needs were, but whatever they were, the king had it covered, right? And not only do you get an allowance, but now it's for the rest of your life. As long as you live, you get an allowance. Pretty amazing story, actually. And it's to remind us that, that God works even in our exile. In some of the smallest ways, sometimes indiscernible, sometimes in ways we can't even see, God is still at work. He's still working. Now, I realize that 2 Kings isn't the end of the Old Testament in our Bibles, but chronologically speaking, it, it's basically right at the end. Ezra and Nehemiah come later for sure, but basically this is kind of almost the end of the story as far as that portion of the Bible goes. And in this text, it's trying to remind you, uh, the, the author of 2 Kings is trying to remind us the prophets are, are trying to say to us that regardless of how long our exile has been, regardless of how much despair that we have experienced and how much despair and pain and struggle and suffering we might have in, right now in our lives, that if the king is alive, there is still hope. And no matter how hard our exile is, no matter how long our exile is, no, no, no matter how long it goes for, if the king is alive, our exile will come to an end. Even in exile, God's promises remain if the king is alive. The king is freed here. He's freed from prison. He's given a seat at the king's table. He has his prison garments removed. He's given an inheritance, uh, an allowance for his daily needs. Our hope in exile is that the king is alive, even in exile. And in exile, put your hope in the king who lives. Because if the king is alive, then there is still hope that your exile will come to an end. And the Old Testament ends with these questions looming. Will God return to his people? Will the king reign from Jerusalem ever again? Will the sons of Abraham ever come? Will the son of David come to establish his throne forever? Is God going to hold true to his promises, or will our exile extend into the unforeseeable future and on into forever? Will this life be painful forever? Will we ever experience the presence of God again? And like a a deer panting for water, that's how badly we should want God. Will we die in a drought, or will we allow God to invade us with his presence once again? And then the New Testament opens up trying to answer these questions in the, the clearest possible terms for us. And, and, and as we get to the New Testament, it's a, it's it's a book of new beginnings. It's the new Genesis. We get that, that genealogy of Jesus, right? He is the son of Abraham. He is the son of David. He is the one in whom God is placing all of his hope. All of his marbles, all of his chips are pushed all in on this one person, Jesus, to end our exile. The incarnation, far from being this cute scene of a, of a baby in a manger is actually a declaration of war, of war of the kingdom of God against the powers of Satan, against sin and against death. This little baby who comes through the womb of Mary comes to declare war against our exile and to free us from the bondage of Satan and sin and death. So this isn't just the story of a, a cute little baby being born on a silent night. This is the story of God saying, my people will not be in exile forever. 
I'm going to invade this kingdom of darkness with my presence and establish the kingdom of God. The means by which he does it is through his death on the cross where he hangs and he bears all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our guilt, all of our pain, all of our suffering. As he is sent outside of the city, he goes there and bears our exile in exile. It is there then that the kingdom of God is established. When the world saw a crucified criminal, the church sees a crucified king reigning as the Davidic Lord um, and the Davidic Messiah, the one who is worthy of all honor and worship and praise. And guess what? This would normally be our communion Sunday, and I love to remind people he didn't stay dead. After three days, he resurrects from the grave and says, I'm establishing my kingdom as far as my kingdom is going to spread as far as the, no the north is from the south and as far as the east is from the west. My kingdom will know no end. And I'm going to ascend to the right hand of the Father. And it's better for you, says Jesus, that I do this. Because your exile will end as I give you the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. And then he will guide you until your exile is finally brought to an end. Then later on in the New Testament, Peter says this. He, he, writes to, he writes to the church and he calls us a group of elect exiles. Even though we've been given this down payment or, or this deposit or this inheritance of the Spirit, he knows, Peter knows, that we are still in exile. Why? Because our king is not here. Our king is alive, but he's not here right now. So Advent is a season for us not just to look back at the Incarnation, but to look forward to the Second Coming, to say, He who is faithful to do it once will be faithful to do it again. He who is faithful to come and end our exile once will come and end it for all time, and we will never enter it again. This is the hope of the New Testament. This is the hope of the Gospel. And we're waiting for our exile to be over. And the Bible says that he is coming quickly. So we better be ready. It's to this moment, this return of Jesus, that Advent is trying to direct our attention to. Advent reminds us that Jesus will come again to end our exile forever. That just as King Jesus came for us once, he will come again. So how do I participate in this story? Well, two things. First, I want you to remember forward. Okay, Remember forward. Over the next few weeks, you're going to be inundated with, with the good news that Jesus came in the manger and that this incarnation is the very centerpiece of the Christian life. And Advent just means coming. And the primary movement of the Bible is the good news of the Bible isn't just that God came to us once, but that he's coming again. Life is a battle of stories, and this Advent story reminds us that there is only one hope. It's not good enough for us to simply put our hope in the first coming of Jesus if we forget about the second. Our hope in this season is to confess and believe and proclaim that he who was faithful to come to us once is faithful to come to us again, and it could be at any minute. Is that where your hope is this year? Remember the first coming of Christ as a means of proclaiming his faithfulness to come, and then remember forward that he is coming again second thing I would invite you to do is I would invite you to simply pray expectantly. In an instant gratification world, delay is often shunned, particularly delayed discipleship. But that's exactly what Advent is proclaiming. Advent is the season of the not yet. Advent is the season of waiting. 
of yearning, of longing, of expecting. Our only hope comes from Jesus, and our only hope in exile is that Jesus is alive and that he is coming for us. Friends, our only hope in the season of exile that we live in, our only hope is in the King. And the good news of the gospel is indeed that the King is alive and that the King is coming again for us. So be faithful and be patient as you wait, because the Lord is faithful to come. Let's pray. Father God, I will give you praise for your wisdom. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. And we just confess with our hearts and minds in this day that so frequently, Lord, we live in the false stories of this world. Lord, we find hope in everything but you, it seems. We do things to try to dull the pain, trying to mask our hurt, trying to mask our guilt and our shame. But Lord, we confess to you this morning, as the Holy Spirit fills our hearts and our minds, we, we believe that there is one true story in this world. And when we try to hide the pain of our exile, Lord, when we go and try to seek other things to be a balm to alleviate that pain, things other than you, God, those things wreck us. And so I pray, God, that you would show it to us, that you would make us aware of those times where we seek other things other than you, that we want something else, but it is indeed only you that can meet our needs. So, Lord, even in this moment, would your Holy Spirit come upon us, not just even individually, but individually as well as corporately, Lord, come upon us as a church, as your people. And God, build in us this eager hope, an eager longing, an expectation for Jesus, who has come and is going to come again. Lord, we believe, we believe in that. That is our hope and trust. We believe in your justice and your righteousness and that he will come again. And God, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Because we could not earn it, we certainly do not deserve it. Yet you gave your life for us. So Lord, we thank you for that. And we long and look forward to your coming again. Strengthen us, strengthen us until that day comes. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, if you've made it this far into this, thanks for watching. You're always welcome to come join us at Glory Baptist Church. You can find out more online at akinchurch.com. And we would love to pray for you. If we could be a blessing to you in some way, let us know. Um, and we hope to see you soon. Have a wonderful week. God bless. Bye.